goes in May. Hello and welcome to the Cyber One YouTube channel. My name is Ray and welcome to my live stream. In this video, uh, we're going to have a look at the basics of controlling a servo using the signal line. To do that, we're going to look, send it a stream of signals that it is expecting to see and from there we're going to try and capture those signals using a logic analyzer. We're going to display the results of that uh, on the stream as we go. And then from there we're going to look at the PCA9685 which is used in a number of InMove robot builds to actually control servos. So before we get into too much depth there, let's have a look at the servo in itself. Servos have uh, been around for a while, they were developed mostly for the radio control industry. Hi. Good morning Lewis, how are you today? Good Ray, how are you? Not too bad. Um, I'll just uh, get you onto the channel as soon as I figure out what I'm doing. Okay, I, I can see you. Yeah, I'm just trying. I'm just trying to make it so you can, everyone can see you. So everybody can see me. <laughs> <laughs> um, they should be able to hear you already. And well, I've got your your logo anyway. Okay. Uh, so As I was saying, with the uh, the servos, what we have is a motor driving a train of gears, which is driving the output. Connected to that output is a potentiometer, which gives us feedback. This is known as a demand position servo. So we set our demand via the yellow control wire, and the servo tries to reach that position. If we change that position, the servo will try and move to that posi new position. If there is a force applied to the arm of the servo, it will try and counter that with power and bring it back to the demand position. So that's a very brief explanation of the servo. So let's set up and uh, actually drive one. So how are you this morning, Lewis? That'd be your afternoon, wouldn't it? I'm doing good. Okay. So um, for this demonstration, I'm going to use this uh, FlySky transmitter and 10 channel receiver. These get, uh, shipped with a six channel receiver. So you can actually use multiple types of uh, receivers with them. Now, to make it easier to capture the signal being sent to this, I'm going to use this Y cable. Okay, so with the uh, capture device, the black wire down the end is ground. We will connect to the ground wire and the purple wire is channel one. Okay, so they're connected. So I need to connect it to power, don't I?
Okay, so the flashing light just indicates the receiver is on, it's powered, it just hasn't got a signal yet. I'll turn on the transmitter. And you can see now we have a signal. And if I move the, we can actually see the uh, servo move. Now, something I already know about this particular uh, transmitter receiver pair is it transmits one millisecond to two millisecond pulses, which is standard. And these servos turn 90 degrees under that range. That'll become important a little bit later on. All right, so let's let me find the uh, logic analyzer, which I had set up last night. and turn it on. All right, so what we have is our logic analyzer. Hopefully you can read that. We can see here we have a pulse width of 1.5 milliseconds. I'm rounding it down to a couple of digits here. Uh, I haven't monitored any other channel I only plugged in the one lead. If I plug in, say, our second lead here, a blue one, we'll put that on the uh, second channel. Capture that as well. And you can see that we have uh, 1.5 milliseconds on both of these. Now, what's also interesting to note is it's 49.98 hertz or a period of 20 milliseconds. Or thereabouts. It's running marginally slow, but that can also be errors in the test equipment or in the transmission receiving equipment. But if I move this all the way to one extreme and capture, you can see that the pulse has changed to one millisecond. If I move all the way to the other extreme, we can see our pulse has changed to two milliseconds. And that's pretty typical of the way the signal for a servo works. So if you go back in history on how these servos work, they were used in four, four and five channel remote control aeroplanes. The idea behind each of the signals was the in the analog system, the transmitter would read, start out with a bit of a pause, a break, then it would read the position of the first pot and then it would transmit a pulse of between one and two milliseconds with the timing dependent on the position of the pulse or the, the pot, the controls joystick. It would then wait until a two millisecond period, sorry, a 20 millisecond period elapsed, and then it would transmit the second channel. Then it would, uh, at the end of the next 20 milliseconds, it would transmit the third channel. And it repeated that until it got through all of the four channels, and then it would come back uh, after a slightly longer delay and re repeat the process. This uh, allowed you to run multiple servos. Um, so this was actually the easy part, demonstrating, if I zoom in a little bit, you can actually see the difference in the signals. Let's zoom out a bit. I must have moved the bottom pot as well. Back to middle. So yeah, very very simple control system, very easy to implement back in the days of analog systems. The challenge we have with our robotic systems is we now need to drive multiples of those. And that's where something like the PCA9685 comes into its own.
Now, this device is actually a 16 channel pulse width modulator, and according to its data sheet for the main chip on board, which I happen to have, it was designed as an I2C controlled LED dimmer control, like brightness control. It was designed to be able to control how bright an LED was. And it's a 16 channel PWM. It's uh, 4,096 different brightness values that it can control an LED. And the way I controlled the LED uh, was how long it left it turned on for over a period of a, a cycle. And this is where pulse width modulation comes in. How wide is the signal? The wider the, the pulse, the brighter your LED. And these are actually quite good and as much as they will do that uh, for 16 channels and they were designed to be daisy chained so you can actually set up chains of these uh, what was it there was six address pins on it so that's uh, what 64 units of these that you can daisy chain onto one I2C bus that's a hell of a lot of LEDs to be controlling Now, the people over at Adafruit, probably Lady Ada herself, uh, had a look at this chip and thought, you know, it's got a big range in its PWM, but we can probably use a small portion of that and drive a servo. You know, if you run this at, say, uh, 50 hertz or 60 hertz or something like that, which is still within the range of the uh, servo, uh, you can take that uh, 4,096 different possible ranges and work out where one millisecond starts or maybe we go a little bit wider, maybe 500 milliseconds and then where 2,500 uh, milliseconds, sorry, microseconds starts or finishes. And that's the range that the servo wants a pulse in. So it turns out that... Uh, this 1,000 milliseconds, uh, or microseconds, is if you're running around about the, uh, or if you look at the whole width of the timing at 50 hertz, that's uh, 102 uh, values in. And then the other extreme, uh, 2,000 microseconds, that's at 512. So that gives us 410 usable values to control the servo and for most applications 410 positions on the servo is quite a lot when you look at the way my robot lab drives these little boards it actually takes it from around 500 microseconds up to 2500 microseconds and that near enough doubles the range which is really cool. Uh, yeah, so what we're going to do is hook up to one of these and have a look how my robot lab drives it and we will see it's actually using exactly the same sort of technology, same pulses, and we will capture the I2C just to show the communication on that and how quick the communication is relative to those pulses. So I'll just connect that up now. G'day Steve, how are you? And Kevin Waters from the US. Good to see both of you here. Now I'm going to use the green and yellow trace for I2C. 
Ray, we're still looking at the uh, PCA 9685 uh, product data sheet. You're right. You are. How's that? Much better. Sorry about that. That's something I've got to uh, learn to do a little bit better, is uh, switching my screens. It's not a bad little uh, capture unit. I can't remember how much I paid for it at the time, but I remember it wasn't that expensive. I'll have to put a link uh, in later on the video I did where I unbox it. Since then, I've actually learned quite a lot about it. So, for one thing, I've learned that I need to use the... Actually, what the hook up? SCL is on the... Is on the yellow wire. So I can add an analyzer, an I2C, connect that to the channel 2, connect that one to channel 3, and I learnt that if you don't set your uh, trigger on the either the clock or the data, it just doesn't work. So we can pick a, uh, tell it to do a scan. And I suppose it'd be a good idea if I actually uh, sent it a signal. Now yeah, that didn't come... Oh yeah, it just come through. Now, for those who are not familiar with my robot lab, uh, this is a project that was started. It's got to be well over twelve years ago now. Uh, by, it was started by Greg Perry. Now, for the last six years I've been involved. Uh, Kevin Waters, who's on stream here as well, uh, has been involved in it very heavily. He's sort of like the second in command. Uh, and they've been working to improve and develop services within the MyRobot Lab environment. This environment is a lightweight environment. It's not like the... Uh, robot operating system which has a lot more features in it but it's also a hell of a lot heavier you really do need a full-size PC just to run it and it only as far as I was aware particularly in the early days when I started looking it only runs on Linux my robot lab on the other hand performs most of the same functions it has most of the same services in it but it's a hell of a lot smaller package and will run on a lot smaller computers as shown by the Raspberry Pi I'm driving it with. It also runs on Windows, Linux and Mac because it's Java based. So there's a lot going for it. It has its problems, um, but it over, the way it's, it's better off having I find it's better to use the My Robot Lab operating system for robot control because it's lightweight and easy to use relative to the other systems that are bigger and more powerful and require more powerful hardware to operate, which makes it ideal for the experimenter and the beginner in robotics. All right, so I've got that hooked up. Uh, I've started the servo service. Previously, I've hooked up the PCA9685. With the MyRobot Lab system, you can create the Raspberry Pi. If we do a scan, you can see we actually did get the system looking on the I2C bus. If I zoom in on those, and that looks like it doing a bit of a request to. Uh, get an acknowledge back from each device to see what's returning. Now 
one of the really cool things with a, a logic analyzer like this is you can capture the data being sent and it'll actually decode the bytes for you. All right, so in this case, I happen to know this is connected on 40. 20 is not connected. I might have to restart that to clear those off. That's from a previous scan I've done. That was when I had a... I was having a play last night and I had one of these devices connected. Uh, these are a eight channel or an eight bit uh, IO expander. These are addressable as well. Not as many addresses as the servo driver, uh, but still you can get a few of these in your robot on the ITC bus if you're running short on uh, IO. These are supported directly by the My Robot Lab system. So with my robot lab, if you're running this on a Raspberry Pi, take advantage of the Raspberry Pi service that lets you scan the I2C. That's only a relatively new feature that's been included. We can then add the uh, PCA9685. Now in my robot lab, it's called the Adafruit. Uh, I2C or Adafruit 16C servo driver. I named mine PCA9685. This is actually a Chinese copy of the original Adafruit board. Once you've got that, select your controller. Make sure you run bus one for the Raspberry Pi. There is an I2C port on the Arduino, which my robot lab controls directly as well. Uh, it uses bus zero, so that's a little bit of a trap for the unwary. Some of the documentation's a little bit misleading on the My Robot Lab site, and look, we'll work our way through and get some of those fixed up. <laughs> uh, I think in the example for the Arduino, it's still got it set as bus one, where it should be bus zero. Uh, these things have little solder pads at the top up here. Might be easier if I use a pointer. So I might just go to a bigger window. So up the top here are solder pads. Those solder pads allow you to set a binary address starting at address 40. That address 40 is in hexadecimal. You solder the first one together and it increments at one. You solder the second one instead, it increments it up to two. You solder the first two together, it takes you up uh, three. Which is handy, you can daisy chain these if you need more I.O. And I've got two of these currently installed in Fred. One in the head, one in the back, with plans to put one in each arm. So having it addressable makes it very easy to control across uh, one controller. Okay, so I've lost one of my windows. Here we go. Okay, so the server I've just created, uh, I haven't set that one up because I've only just created. I'm going to attach it to the PCA9685. If you have multiple PCA9685s services created and you do need one for each one that you use, or if you have some Arduinos connected, they will all appear in this list. You need to specify the pin you're going to be connecting to. So I'm going to connect to pin zero at this time, and then we can attach it. I'll just reset the uh, capture for the scope. Now you can enable that straight off the bat. Uh, with this enable control, but it will do that automatically uh, as soon as we go to move it. So the control for the servo, if we now move this down, we can see we 
get a command signal from the Raspberry Pi to the board to control it. Now for some reason I'm not exactly sure why it's doubling the address. I've noticed that on with I have noticed that for a while now. It literally doubles all the addresses. Which is why when we looked at the scan it did, it started at two and then four. If we scroll this along, actually I'll zoom in zoom out a bit. So there's four control signals that were sent, probably the four different positions as I move to that. We didn't get a capture. That would be because I'm hooked onto the wrong end of the board. So zero is up this end and 15 up this end. There we go. So what you're seeing here is the command packets from my robot lab. So the address, a com uh, I'm going to have to read back through the data sheet on these to find out what the control sequence was. But one of these, or two of these, is actually the setup of the PWM. One will be to select the channel. Oh, that's interesting. The rest position is not working. It's enabled. Okay, so we can see just switch that back. So we can see our uh, pulse width here. So our pulse is 1.39, so we're not quite centered there. And we've got a period of 15.49, so 15 and a half uh, mil 15. That's not set up right. I know, 15.49 millisecond period and 1.399 milliseconds for the pulse. That's right. So with this, we can, you can see here I've only created one servo. We've got one, one channel operating. I did see some bugs where the this uh, was not initializing correctly. That was back a couple of versions, three or four versions ago, I think, of the My Robot Lab. Um, Greg has looked at and I think fixed that bug. He's still working on some other services. But yeah, these these are actually very easy to drive when it's all said and done, which is why I'm actually using them. Uh, I just found the InMove service wasn't all that uh, helpful for me because it was 
using a particular method of control and not as flexible. All right, so if anyone has any questions, I'll uh, fire up a couple of other servo channels. What I should probably do is uh, fire up a lot more servo channels. Oh, it's the same bus. Actually, that's uh, the wrong controller. You might know, Kevin, is there a way to remove a controller or a ser a service in the web GUI? There is in the old swing GUI, long live swing. What I should have done was enabled it. Oh, I haven't got anything connected to that pin. It still should have worked. Maybe if I attached it. All right, I'm going to plug in a few more of these. G'day Kevin, how are you today?
thing. Let's add some more servos. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I've got a bit of equipment. Doesn't necessarily know how to. I, I don't necessarily know how to use it all, but I have got a little bit of equipment. So I've got two I've turned the auto disable off on. Um, I think I found another bug. I'll explore this one a little bit further. When I'm disabling the auto disable so that it uh, doesn't disable the output after a period of three seconds, um, it doesn't appear to work at all anymore. The logic analyzer has 16 channels on it, so semi sort of convenient for these boards these boards have 16 channel outputs on them for 16 servos but I'm using two of my logic channels to capture the ITC bus at the same time I could uh, fire up an oscilloscope and show that as well uh, but I haven't started it up or set it up in the uh, OBS studio to be able to bring that in very easily. I uh, tend to use my little oscilloscope more than the, uh, the bigger one. So this is my uh, little oscilloscope. I'm It'll actually act as a uh, signal generator as well, but it's a full oscilloscope, whereas this is just an, a logic analyzer. So the logic analyzer, for those who may not be aware, will only show an on or an off signal, whereas the oscilloscope will show a voltage level over time.
it can be very handy when you're trying to hunt down a bug where something is not working for some reason. Uh, sometimes you might get an output working that shouldn't be working and it can be crosstalk between two wires running in parallel. Uh, this is where having the logic analyzer and having the oscilloscope can be an advantage. The logic analyzer will show you straight on and off signals that you're outputting, whereas the oscilloscope will show you crosstalk uh, and other noise on the line that you won't necessarily see. So I can add more servos to this. From up to six. That um, auto disable bug that I come across is only affecting the first servo. It's not affecting any of the others. It's working all right now. Okay, so that's um, 180 degree according to the output from my robot lab. And when we look at the signal, it is 2.15 milliseconds with a period of 15.48. I got limits set. No, I don't. And for a minimum period, five, seven, six. Two, two, three. Yeah. Now the testing I was doing um, just the other day was uh, showing slightly wider range than that. I was using a different version of my robot lab though. So 
So I've got seven servos created so far. None of the other channels appear to be uh, active at all. I have had that error before, and I think it was an initialization error in 1.1.523, where previously to running that version, I'd run the I2C bus, uh, or run that servo with another uh, variant. Then when I fired it up, I got an unexpected movement on a channel I hadn't turned on yet. Now, normally you would leave that auto disable turned on. By default it is on, although the uh, display doesn't appear to be showing that. That way you don't uh, confi You don't leave a control signal on a servo where it doesn't need to be running normally. And you don't burn out your servo. A uh, little bit of a caveat if you're running the eMove robot uh, the ammo plate you do need to leave on because when you lift the arm up if you don't if you turn it off the arm will fall under gravity something we may need to look at in the program to turn it off when we're not actually using it I'm going to select the servo and give it the number here. So if I move this, you can see it energizes.
Now I thought the default was to have it enabled. I think I might have to do a bit more experimentation in that. Am I up to four nine? I swapped my last two pins around on the analyzer. That's better. The updates are only occurring on this when I get a an ITC signal coming through because I've triggered my update from here. And that gives us all 16 channels set up and running. So I can only show 14, yeah, 14 of the 16 channels of the output, uh, mostly because I'm using two of the channels for the I2C monitoring, these two. I can move them across. But you can see here we can get all different signal type or signal widths or pulse widths based on where I randomly dumped them when I moved the controls. 
2.28 down to 1.907 so I can actually set some of these let's set servo 2 to be a really short servo 1 to be the longest is already set there so we're seeing uh, 763 to 2.2. Just to help with the confusion, this is changing its range measurement at the same time. So that's 763 microseconds and 2.2 milliseconds or 2,268 microseconds. So yeah, having... 16 channels in one spot is very handy you can connect these to an arduino and daisy chain them from the arduino so if for some reason uh, the 64 of these is not enough for you off the raspberry pi you can connect an arduino and use the itc on the arduino to give you another 64 and if that's not enough you can add a second arduino so i cannot see where you would need quite so many servos and quite so many servo drivers but yeah uh, i have seen projects with a hell of a lot of servos in them used in artwork so if you have any questions i'll be happy to answer them uh, I've covered everything that I wanted to cover with this. You can drive these not just with my robot lab, obviously. You can drive them from Python within the Raspberry Pi itself. Uh, you can connect one of these to an Arduino, connect that to a Windows PC, and then drive your Windows PC. Um, if there are no questions, then I uh, shall call this the end of the stream for now. Are you still floating around, Lewis? I'm showing log Lewis is logged in, but not talking. <laughs> But yeah, they are actually a very easy device to use, um, which is why I've been using them for the last six years in the uh, the robot build I have. All right, I will uh, see you in the next uh, video and or stream. I don't have an end stream cap. <laughs>